Good afternoon or good evening and good morning to some of you. Thank you for joining us for this uh, event. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Jean Rabi. I'm the former CEO of Natexis Investment Managers. But uh, most importantly, I'm uh, the parent of a proud parent of a McGill graduate. And I'm happy to uh, kick off this, this event. This event, which uh, is going to be is going to be centered around the comments from two uh, key faculty members of McGill, Professor Lewis and Professor Hall, who will talk about Brexit, how it happened, why it happened, despite its improbable nature, and uh, hopefully answer some of the some of the questions you may have. And the event will be moderated by Caroline Bresnahan, who, unlike me, is a graduate of McGill, has been living like me for a number of years in in Europe, and uh, will will moderate this this panel. Before I turn it over to the panelists, allow me to share a few thoughts because I've been living myself. I'm from Quebec originally, but I've been living myself for the past 30 years in, in Europe. And as the then CEO of one of the largest asset managers in the world, of course, what was happening in the UK was of high relevance to our business. But uh, I'll share a few personal remarks given the content of, of this panel. I think first for continental Europeans, Brexit continues, was for a long time, and continues to seem to be um, incomprehensible in large part because for continental Europeans, the UK had the best deal, open quote, close quote, not part of Schengen, not part of the monetary union, and I think a special deal on the EU budget. So when you combine all of this and you come, to, come down to the conclusion that notwithstanding that, the UK still benefited, and I'm simplifying from the four fundamental freedoms of the European Union, it seemed incomprehensible, therefore improbable. Secondly, and that's a comment I've made publicly, I thought the European politicians, continental European politicians, took a, a attack which I disagreed with, which was to 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 um, to portray the debate with the UK as a win lose situation, win for European Union, lose for the UK. When in fact, to us in the financial sector at least, this was a lose lose proposition. Um, and uh, thirdly, for for four years. We live through week after week. This is one of the most important weeks of Brexit, or this is a critical week for Brexit. So we went through a roller coaster of emotions, headlines, um, and frankly, myself, I've said publicly many times that I thought that Brexit would never happen, that at some point in time, there would be a political space that would open up, that would allow perhaps the Union, European Union to make a gesture or compromise or find some way to allow a political space to open in the UK to put into question the outcome of the 2016 referendum. Well, it didn't happen and Brexit has happened. And Michel Barnier will soon be publishing his memoirs about uh, the, the unseen of the negotiations. So uh, perhaps there'll be a, a lot more headlines again on Brexit. But for the time being, I'll stop there and turn it over to our uh, to our panelists. Great. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening from London, England. I have the pleasure and honor of introducing two professors from McGill to discuss the causes and consequences of Brexit. Interestingly, both professors were born in England and have both become Canadian citizens. So the topic of Brexit is of personal significance. I'll begin by introducing Professor Lewis. Professor Lewis is a historian of modern Britain in the Department of History and Classical Studies at McGill. He grew up in Blackburn, Lancashire, and was educated at Oxford and Harvard. His publications, research, and supervisory work have been focused on topics such as the British middle classes, British urban history in the long 19th century, British and Irish nationalisms, and British queer history, areas in which he also offers upper level courses. Professor Lewis also teaches survey courses which expand on British and European history as of the 17th and 18th centuries, including the history of sexuality in Europe and North America and the First and Second World Wars. It's great to have you join us, Professor Lewis. Thank you. Professor Hall is an Emeritus James McGill Professor of Comparative Historical Sociology. He has held previous posts at Southampton University, 
the London School of Economics, and Harvard University. He has authored numerous publications on a range of topics related to sociology, civil society, and international affairs. His research areas focused on nationalism and war, the economic consequences of the size of nations, sociological theory, and at present, he's writing on the interaction between nation states and empires. Professor Hall's own teaching and research career has garnered him several accolades, including the 2016 Prix du Québec, Lyon Guerin, and the Royal Society of Canada's 2016 Innis Guerin Medal. Professor Lewis, can you walk us through the causes of Brexit, please? I certainly can. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to show you some slides um, so that you don't have to stare at me. Um, can you see the screen? Okay, very good. Well, I started teaching courses on 20th century British history and on British and Irish nationalisms in the late 1990s when the EU was on the up and up. First, uh, Tony Blair's new Labour had recently been uh, elected, uh, committed to playing a pivotal role in Europe. There would be no return, he promised, to the Labour Party's flirtation in the 1980s with pulling out of Europe so as to establish socialism in one country. Second, the Northern Ireland uh, Good Friday Agreement in 1998 bringing an end to the troubles was possible precisely because the boundaries between the UK and the Irish Republic could be blurred within the European Union. And third, the Tory party in the 1990s had torn itself apart over Europe and been sent packing to the opposition benches, largely as a consequence. So Britain's future in Europe, in other words, seemed secure. So why in 2016 did the British public vote to leave the EU and I had to radically revise all of my lectures? How did a minority of Eurosceptics, whom David Cameron dismissed as fruitcakes, loonies and closet racists, end up controlling the agenda? How was the Tory party family psychodrama imposed upon the nation? And how did the vote leave English Nationalist Party government of Boris Johnson end up in power? I would like to stress how improbable all of this was. It is highly unusual for a prosperous, stable democracy to take such a self-defeating step, to choose to increase barriers to trade, to diminish its position in the world, and to threaten its internal integrity. With the exception of the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, all of the political parties at Westminster at the time of the referendum were by majority opposed to leaving the EU. So was the bulk of business, finance, manufacturing, the trade unions, the universities, the professions, the economists, the political and intellectual elites. And yet we're out. How? Why? In the skimpiest of sketches, because I only have a very few minutes, I like to propose four big causes and four little causes. A first rough draft of the writing of history. Big cause one, the Second World War. Because Britain emerged victorious, not having experienced the traumas of defeat and occupation, Britons did not have the same incentive as the continental countries to do everything it takes after two calamitous world wars to keep the peace by blending economies and sharing sovereignty. Brits took and take great pride in the image of plucky little Britain alone. Pride in British exceptionalism, in being an island nation detached from the continent, in maintaining close ties to the Commonwealth, and in the so-called special relationship with the United States. And so Britain always remained semi-detached during its 47 years in the EEC and the EU. Britain's never developed a European identity or loyalty. 
fewer Brits consider themselves European than in any other EU country. Big cause two, the end of empire. As an American Secretary of State famously put it in the early 1960s, Britain has lost an empire, but not yet found a role. But it's not just nostalgic delusions of grandeur that try to compensate for the loss of great power imperial status and look, that looked vainly to a global rather than a European role. The retreat from empire also left a divided island with all the continuing consequences of that partition. It left a toxic legacy of racist beliefs targeting black and South Asian immigrants. For sure, Britain is much more at ease with a multicultural population than it was half a century ago. But anti-immigrant rhetoric can be and was during the referendum exploited to a considerable extent. And the end of empire directly began the unraveling of Britain with the rise of Scottish and Welsh nationalism leading to a devolution of power. Only after the Scots and Welsh secured devolved government did English nationalism, formerly subsumed under Britishness, begin to bark. And Brexit is the most evident manifestation of an insular reactionary English nationalism. It caused three, deindustrialization. In the 2016 referendum, the average leave voter was likely to have a lower income and a lower education and to be older and more socially conservative than the average remain voter. This meant that leave picked up not only the bulk of the traditional Tory vote, but also a lot of support from the so-called left behind, once solidly reliable Labour voters. The roots of the shift lay in the transition, especially under the Thatcher government in the 1980s, from a manufacturing and extractive economy characterized by stable, well-paying working class jobs and strong trade unions, to a service and financial economy characterized by precarious working class employment, post-industrial towns, stagnant wages, increasing inequality, and weak trade unions. The decline of its traditional base prompted the Labour Party under Tony Blair to increase its hunt for votes in the center ground and among the young, university graduates, and the socially liberal, as well as ethnic minorities. It worked for a time, but increasingly the marginalized white working classes concluded that labor did not represent them. This was especially the case after the financial crash of 2008 inaugurated a decade of austerity, further exacerbating inequalities. Dissatisfaction in Scotland could find an outlet in the left-leaning and pro-European populism of the Scottish Nationalist Party. In England and Wales, it was other populists that filled the void. UKIP, the Vote Leave campaign, and Johnson English nationalists, displacing the blame for the country's malaise onto the wrong targets, Europe and immigrants. Big cause four, the end of the Cold War. This allowed for the expansion and deepening of the European Union. The principle of free movement of peoples had brought around 60,000 EU immigrants to Britain per annum in the 1990s and early 2000s. But after 12 countries, mainly from the former Soviet bloc, joined in 2004 to 7, immigration climbed to 268,000 by 2014. These immigrants became a ready target for UKIP and Leave campaigners who had particular success in areas that saw a significant growth in East and Central European arrivals. A third of Leave voters indicated that regaining control over immigration and borders was the number one reason why they voted to exit the EU. And 50% of Leave voters suggested their main reason was so that decisions about the UK should be taken in the UK and not in Brussels. And here the movement of the EU towards ever closer political union since the 1980s, rather than just 
a common or single market had a very negative impact on a semi-detached country like Britain, giving space for Euroscepticism to grow. So those are my four big causes. The Second World War, the end of empire, deindustrialization, and the end of the Cold War, which slowly moved the tectonic plates and made a Brexit vote possible. But to make it actually come about, there had to be myriad small causes. I'll just mention four. First, the EU's mishandling of crises over the past decade, including the sovereign debt and migrant crises, which gave every impression that its leadership was incompetent and or not responsive to public opinion. None of this served as a good advertisement at a critical moment. Secondly, a largely hostile press supplying a steady drip drip diet of anti-EU propaganda over the decades, later reinforced by social media. Third, a calamitous, calamitous failure of Tory party leadership. David Cameron, whose decision to hold a referendum in order to prevent support leaching to UKIP must rank as one of the worst in British history. Theresa May, who took an advisory wafer thin referendum result as an instruction to aim for a hard Brexit, rather than to negotiate some kind of Norway option that would at least have kept the UK in the customs union and the single market, which could then have been put to a second referendum to see if that's what people really wanted. And Boris Johnson, who brought about an even harder Brexit as apparently nothing more than a career move to get himself into 10 Downing Street. Four, Labour Party members' brave decision to foist Jeremy Corbyn, the least electable option on the parliamentary party. Under his leadership, when any halfway decent opposition would have been running rings around a government engaging in fratricide, and after a decade of unpopular austerity overseen by this government, Corbyn pulled off the worst result for Labour since 1935 and gifted Johnson an 80-seat majority. So that is my, no doubt, idiosyncratic quick sketch as to how and why we got not only an improbable Brexit, but an even more unlikely hard Brexit. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lewis. That's very interesting indeed. And I'd like to introduce and um, ask, invite Professor Hall to give a short presentation on his work on Brexit in particular. Uh, if you could also explain how Brexit is playing out in your opinion, Professor Hall. It's a pleasure to do so uh, and uh, welcome to the audience. Uh, it's always a little hard following Brian Lewis because his summary of causes was simply excellent. And uh, on this occasion, I agree with him. Uh, I didn't agree with him in the past because I always thought that Brexit might happen. Um, so we have a slight difference in the past. Um, I'm going to pick up on one particular thing that he said and then talk about two things. The United Kingdom, its chances of remaining together, and economic affairs. Just two themes, there could be many more, but those are the two important ones. Um, it's important to remember that the vote in 2016 uh, was not accepted, that's to say there was a vote to remain in Northern Ireland and Scotland. So the question of the unity of the United Kingdom becomes extremely important. Um, I have one slight difference with what Brian Lewis said, which is that when Theresa May, May was Prime Minister, she wasn't in fact after the hardest of hard Brexits. Um, she was still imagining the UK within the uh, single market and the customs union. What transpired in the end was the hardest of hard Brexits, Brexits uh, completely leaving everything. That's Boris Johnson's uh, Brexit. Um, and that's what we have to deal with. Um, why was it that um, things went so terribly wrong inside the situation 
uh, first of all in Northern Ireland and then in Scotland. Um, had Theresa May's rather softer Brexit, staying inside the economic institutions being maintained, um, there'd have been no question of difficulties with the border. Um, some sovereignty would have been lost, but fundamentally economic affairs would have continued. That's what Theresa May wanted. It was blocked by the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland. Um, this mattered enormously because one of the things that we see now is the re-emergence of uh, violence in Northern Ireland. Um, there's several local causes, but a fundamental uh, part of this is Protestants, principally in Northern Ireland, thinking that now there is a border, but the border is in the Irish Sea. Northern Ireland has remained inside the European Union effectively. So there is a border inside the Irish Sea, and the Protestants in Northern Ireland say, we are now second class, class British citizens. Uh, they don't like this. Um, this is causing an enormous amount of uh, trouble. There are negotiations going on to see if some way of dealing with this problem can be arranged between the European Union and uh, Britain. It's very unlikely because uh, you can't just export your goods into Northern Ireland and then have them flowing freely into the European Union where there's no border. Uh, the European Union will never accept that. Um, so here's a situation of um, tremendous uh, difficulty. Um, there are things that one can say about it if we think about the future. Northern Ireland, uh, which has caused uh, the Irish situation, which has caused so much difficulties in European uh, and British history, uh, is very volatile. Um, the population in Northern Ireland is changing. Uh, it's becoming Catholic. The next census will show that the Catholic population is larger than the Protestant population. Um, there is the possibility, people now start to talk about, the breakup of the United Kingdom and the possibility of Irish unification. Um, this is an extremely difficult matter. Um, many Catholics in the North do not wish this. Um, and many people themselves don't want it either. But there is the movement in that direction. And if there's a movement in that direction which causes Protestant uh, uh, anger and violence, there will eventually be uh, some reaction from the IRA. So one, uh, if one could click one's fingers and say in 30 years time there was Irish reunification, this would perhaps be a wonderful thing. But it's rather scaring in the short term because there's potential of a very great deal of conflict. So the, the uh, power of the United Kingdom has been uh, noticeably diminished and there's very great danger uh, in that particular area. Northern Ireland, if it goes wrong, can start to take an enormous amount of the attention of any governing class. Scotland uh, also voted uh, to remain, heavily so. Uh, it had lost an independence referendum just before that. Um, everything has changed now because it's in a different world. Uh, there's great tension in Scotland. On the one hand, uh, the support for independence has gone up. They have an extremely able leader um, clamoring for another referendum, likely to win uh, a great majority in the elections in early May. So there's a great demand, but curiously, Scotland faces a new problem. Uh, if it was to leave, there would be a hard border to the south uh, where most of its trade, most of its interactions have taken place in the past. So Scotland, if it has enough referendum, is going to be on this terrible fork, uh, desire for it, but economic difficulties. In a way, it's the opposite of the Irish situation. Uh, if the Democratic Union, Unionist Party was clever, it would realize that it's in both worlds. It could benefit from it. Um, but that's not a particularly intelligent leadership. So the United Kingdom as a whole really is very severely under stress. Um, it's not the case that the leadership in Westminster 
has paid very much attention to this at all, uh, and I think the situation is, in a certain sense, getting out of hand. So that's one theme that we certainly have to think about. Um, the other theme is, of course, trade. Um, it's very important people that people know that the actual agreement uh, to do with trade is a very, very thin one as far as the United Kingdom is concerned. It's a concern with trade, goods, physical things, not with services, including finance. The British economy now is based on services, so it means that uh, such agreement as there is only affects a very, very small amount of the economy. Um, this is very dangerous for the British economy. The British economy from quite a long time ago in the 19th century has been an, an economy in which the finance sector has been dominant. In order to remain dominant, uh, this very technical thing, transporting rights, the ability to act inside the European Union's financial markets, need to be guaranteed. They haven't been guaranteed. And one can see quite a few European pol politicians, particularly Macron, who would love to establish a European finance industry at the expense of London. So there are very great dangers there. It's a terrible deal as a whole for the state of the British economy as it has become. But beyond that, um, there are very obvious things which become clearer every day. Um, this is a world of enormous bureaucracy now, the filling in of forms. That has killed live, live shellfish from Britain, fresh fish from Britain, because instead of being there immediately in a lorry within a matter of hours, it takes about two and a half days to get your product there. Trade uh, initially fell by about 40 percent both ways. It's regained slightly, but the long-term effect of having barriers against your closest market is bound to be very dramatic. Much investment came to Britain because it was an English-speaking country inside the European Union. Some of that will now go to Ireland, probably Indian investment will go there rather than to Britain. Um, there are endless future arguments to come. Brexit is not over. Uh, Macron today is saying that he's reluctant to have the deal about trade still in front of the European Parliament accepted unless there's further concession on fishing rights. Um, it's not even a done deal yet. Um, the relations between Britain and Europe since Brexit have been terrible and there's absolutely no indication at the moment they're going to get better. I can see all, for, all sorts of uh, future causes for argument. Um, will Britain have a level playing field in terms of subsidizing industries, which is sort of agreed? I think they can argue about this forever. Uh, so uh, it's a very messy situation. The United Kingdom is in trouble and the economic relations are badly dented with plentiful reasons for argument in the near future. Thank you, Professor Hall. I'll ask the first question of our question and answer session to Professor Lewis, if I may, and then the same question to Professor Hall. Is there a silver lining despite all of the challenges? It's difficult to find one. Uh, I have been looking hard. Um, the only thing I can suggest is that maybe England is being um, shorn of its great power pretensions. If we do see the breakup of the United Kingdom, which I think we probably will over the next few years, um, then maybe the country can begin to reconcile itself to being uh, a mid-sized uh, European uh, economy with no special pretensions uh, in the world. Uh, for sure, uh, we would lose the uh, uh, permanent seats in the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, if we can begin to look inwards uh, a little bit more, and begin to tackle some of the real problems uh, besetting uh, England right now, 
um, the mismatch in power between the center and the regions, um, the horrendous level of uh, inequality, uh, the need to tackle climate change, things like that, then maybe we can look forward to something more positive. Um, and if all of that ha happens, that maybe in a generation or two, uh, we can imagine reapplying uh, to be let back in to the European Union. So it's maybe not totally a gloomy situation. I mean, everything that John has outlined uh, slower growth, uh, flight of manufacturing and, and finance to the uh, European Union, uh, greater bureaucracy, the breakup of the UK, renewed conflict in Ireland. Um, all of that uh, is, is very, very imaginable, um, but it's just about possible that there could be some positive benefits uh, in all of this as well. Thank you, Professor Lewis. Professor Hall, you to try that question as well. You can try the question, but you won't get a different answer. Uh, Brian Lewis uh, uh, said exactly what I would have said. Um, uh, of course, um, there is the possibility that the imperial illusions that he described so well uh, will one day break and a sense of normality uh, will return. There have been one or two indications that that's uh, people who wish to do that. Um, it's important to know that in Brexit, there were two forces, really. Um, there was a movement from below worried about immigration and the industrialization, but it would not have happened without the leadership that came at the top, which that's where the concern with the imperial illusions, punching above your weight, weight uh, and, and so on. That's, those were present and um, they are present uh, at the moment. People do begin to see that uh, Johnson was a uh, was and is a terrible liar. Uh, he's in trouble now. Um, there are members of his own party, uh, some of them expelled, who are fighting uh, for a different future. So, so my view is exactly the same as uh, Brian's. It's going to require a lot, though. Um, the Conservative Party is one thing, but there's also the Labour Party. Um, the Labour Party is still extremely conservative when it comes to dealing with Scotland. Uh, Scotland could, I'm pretty certain, stay in the, inside the United Kingdom, but it requires much more imagination. And, and the Labour Party is you know, having still the hopes of MPs from Scotland uh, also needs to change quite a bit. Um, so to move towards this uh, middle size, uh, prosperous, um, slightly uh, modest country that Brian and I would like um, will not be easy, but that is the thing to aim for, for sure. Probably includes electoral reform as well. Okay, thank you for that. Recently, there's been an issue with the fulfillment and transportation of vaccines uh, from the EU to the UK. Professor Lewis, how would you, uh, how do you foresee future trade engagement playing out in light of the current atmosphere? Uh, the whole question of uh, vaccine nationalism. Um, this, uh, the, the delivery of vaccines to the British population is the one area where the Johnson government has been successful um, during the time of, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, every other aspect has been a complete disaster. But it's getting a lot of kudos at the moment because uh, it encouraged uh, the, the scientists uh, and the NHS to organize this vaccine rollout um, from the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, the European Union uh, obviously did not do uh, as good a job. Uh, it tried to centralize things. Uh, it didn't have any experience uh, in this. It still might be the case that the centralized EU uh, approach will deliver more vaccines more quickly to the whole of the EU population than if each individual country had tried it separately. So the jury is still out on that. Um, but um, particularly in the early stages uh, of, of uh, vaccination, uh, the EU uh, did not seem to be doing well at all. And, and uh, 
this um, the, the fight, uh, the struggle um, that uh, took place uh, between the uh, EU uh, bureaucrats uh, and the British government, um, and uh, the, the threats to uh, invoke uh, various articles of uh, the uh, Irish Protocol um, did not look at all good um, and indicated, uh, as John suggested, that Brexit uh, is, is far from completed and that this kind of uh, petty nationalistic rivalry is going to continue and be with us uh, indefinitely. Another question that's just come in here as well. Uh, what is the future of, we, we touched on this already uh, briefly with respect to what does the future of the UK look like, but what do you anticipate are the, I suppose, the top um, issues for or consequences for the union, um, Professor Hall? Well, I think that it's really clear already uh, the great place where there's going to be strife in the near future is Northern Ireland. Um, it, I think something is going to happen there. Um, your previous question is really about the lack of trust. There's no trust between the European Union and Britain. So it's very hard to imagine a fundamental change in the protocol. Um, uh, the European Union does not trust Johnson. Uh, so I think the tensions in Northern Ireland are very likely to increase. Um, that's very, very, very scary. Um, the Dublin government is now really rather sophisticated. Um, they're setting up a committee to imagine what reunification would look like. Uh, they have all sorts of ideas, uh, not a federal system, but a federacy, special rights for Northern Ireland and so on and so on. Um, I think that's a live issue. I don't think Irish reunification could uh, take place in the short term under any circumstances. Um, but in 30 years, it's possible to imagine that happening, although I can't imagine it happening without a great deal of violence. So the fundamental thing is Northern Ireland. It's more important than Scotland, uh, although Scotland will probably sooner rather than later have the right to another referendum. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. I'd like to just sorry. remind, our, sorry, please. Sorry. Could I just add that? Um, and, and because Wales always gets missed out in these discussions, and I have Welsh ancestors and a Welsh name, uh, I'm going to say something about the Welsh. Um, mm. it, it seems for the first time that there is a movement towards uh, independence in Wales. You'd all, always had a smallish band of Welsh nationalists, uh, particularly based around uh, linguistic and cultural issues. Um, but um, because of, of Brexit uh, and everything that's been happening in the last few years, uh, you are seeing more of the Welsh population uh, thinking seriously for the first time about the possibility of independence. And I think uh, if uh, Scotland splits away, uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland becomes more integrated with the Irish Republic, then the Welsh um, are not going to want to remain dominated by the English nationalists uh, for too long. So I think we'll probably see in a number of decades uh, the complete breakup of the United Kingdom. Perhaps I could add one thing here. Uh, of course. Questions of separatism are uh, part of Canadian life. Um, there are two types of uh, secession. Uh, I lived in Czechoslovakia when the velvet divorce took place between both sides. Uh, fundamentally without violence, I don't think a single person was killed. Um, it was easy. Um, there hadn't been many cross-national marriages. They had different state traditions relatively recently. Uh, it was easy. It worked well. Uh, separatisms on other occasions can be violent. There's no reason why you can't have more states in the world in a cooperative frame. Uh, the trouble is getting there. Um, I think it could be managed relatively easily in Scotland. Um, great economic costs, I think, to the Scots. But the situation in Northern Ireland is difficult. Um, if you think about other cases, say the French uh, colonial 
people in uh, Algeria, they went home. The Protestants in Northern Ireland are not going home because they've been there for a very long time. It is their home. So the potential for violence there is very great. But things are moving. The population dynamic is one thing. It's also the case for some considerable time that the local institutions are changing. Um, the universities in Belfast used to be for Protestant men. Protestant men are now seeing much greater social mobility chances by going to England. Um, so everything is changing, but the remaining Protestant working class in Northern Ireland has the potential to be very militant. Uh, and in the short term, that's a very scary prospect. Thank you. I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind our audience that if there are any questions you'd like to have posed to the professors, if you could please enter those questions into your chat. So any questions that you'd like to have asked, and we'll try to get through them here in the next little, little while we have together. One of the questions that has come through is, what complexities are brought in if British people take on dual nationality to keep their EU privileges? And I'll, ask, I'll ask Professor Hall that question. Um, I think the great complexity remains uh, the extent to which each country will allow medical and health care for its uh, the citizens of another country. Uh, that's still not fully agreed. There's great uncertainty amongst English people in Spain about this, where the population is rather large. Um, you don't actually have to have dual citizenship you can take residency uh, in a European country and maintain those privileges. Um, but this is one of those areas which is still under negotiation. Um, the French French community in London uh, remains worried. Uh, the guarantees for them are not uh, uh, you know, in writing, not secure. Um, would it be the case that anybody else coming in would gain same privileges? Probably not. Um, uh, Spain and France are now becoming rather difficult, but if you can get two citizenships, you're all right. Um, the enormous number of people who've require, acquired Irish citizenship recently uh, is uh, an indication of how much people would like to have it, but that's, those numbers are fairly small. The free movement of people inside the European Union uh, is a real problem, uh, and that is coming to an end. One hopes that the arrangements for people who already, British people, for example, who are already in Spain. One hopes that those will be maintained, but there are a lot of question marks about that. But if you can get two passports, uh, get get them immediately. I have three. Okay. Thank you. One of our next questions here is: What would be the impact on Britain's leadership of the Commonwealth if the UK breaks up, Professor Lewis? So what would be the impact on Britain's leadership if the com on the Commonwealth if the UK breaks up from our audience? Um, well, the Commonwealth has become rather a, a weakened, diminished uh, institution um, over the decades. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't have much clout uh, in world affairs uh, nowadays. Uh, I would imagine that um, the disparate parts of the former United Kingdom uh, would all remain uh, members of the Commonwealth um, and uh, would get together with all of the other Commonwealth heads uh, from time to time to uh, draft resolutions, uh, which by and large they then failed to impose when they got back home. I'm a little bit cynical about uh, about the, the Commonwealth, but uh, you know, it's always better to have a forum where people talk uh, about the big issues uh, than not. Um, but I, I don't think, um, rather than Britain having a, a, a seat in the Commonwealth, uh, it would be England, Scotland, Wales, and uh, Northern Ireland that it would have separate seats. Perhaps I could add a slight comment here. Um, the uh, Tory party leadership, because of that sort of in, in imperial heritage, sometimes talks about the benefits of, sort of recreating parts of the empire. We can have trade again with uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, those trading links were uh, destroyed, really, when Britain entered the European Union. Um, 
an empire light. Um, so the Commonwealth mentality, the idea that we're part of something larger, uh, is still there. Uh, and I think it's rather dangerous. Uh, after 1945, the British economy suffered because it did trade quite extensively with the Commonwealth, not with Europe. Uh, to be successful as an economy in the modern world, you need to be trading in high-tech advanced markets, which make you change so you can be at the leading edge of technical change. Um, if Britain was to concentrate on re-establishing imperial links, I don't think that would give us a prosperous future. And I would all add to that, there is no indication that uh, the leading uh, most populous Commonwealth countries uh, would be interested in re-establishing such links. Uh, India, for example, um, is going to uh, continue to want to do most of its trade uh, with uh, the much bigger market of the European Union uh, rather than Britain. Okay, great. Thank you. We had a lot of questions to get through here, so we're going to uh, we're going to start with uh, with the next one. Uh, are we seeing any tendency yet for buyer's remorse amongst any of the segments within England who voted Leave, or is it too soon for any substantial impact to be felt at the level of the individual citizen? I, I think the answer to that, if I understood the question, is yeah. that it's very remarkable so far that the voting blocks. Uh, remain very solid. There's a just two, three percent move uh, of regret of people who might uh, now vote to remain. But by and large, the uh, sort of pillarized nature of British society is still present. At least that, that's how I see it. Maybe Brian Lewis sees it differently. Well, I would say that um, the, there was no majority for leave before the referendum. Um, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, if you look at polls over a long period, only fleetingly, if ever, do you get a majority for leave. In the period after the referendum, that kind of pattern was uh, re-established. Uh, in, in other words, for the vast majority of the time, there has been um, a, a slight uh, majority for Remain, which of course uh, is why um, the governments uh, of May and Johnson uh, refused to countenance the second referendum because they thought they would lose it uh, if you ask the people again what they actually wanted. Um, and the other thing I would say is that um, even though the, block, the, the voting block for Leave uh, has remained fairly high, somewhere in the 40s, uh, the voting bloc in favour of the hard kind of Brexit that we have now ended up with is substantially lower than that. Um, so it, we have a real democratic uh, deficit here. Um, government has uh, negotiated something that, if it were to be put to an up and down vote, would probably be uh, voted down and by quite a large majority. Again, this is uh, a, a, another reason for electoral reform um, to uh, prevent um, one party, the Tory party at the moment, from uh, attaining uh, a substantial majority, uh, even with a minority of the vote. And on, on the next point, do you think that working rights will improve for UK passport holders in the, in the EU? I think um, it's an open question. Um, by and large, if you're talking about British workers inside the European Union, that's how I understand the. Then there's the, obviously been uh, just an enormous loss. Um, you, uh, uh, I have a British passport. I can no longer work in a European Union country. It's gone. Um, do I think they'll improve? Um, it's an open question. There's a great deal of argument about it. Um, the crucial economic sector is whether they'll allow finance experts to work inside the European Union. Um, some people would like that in Europe because they think Britain has certain skills that they need, but there are very considerable blocks which says it's going to be tough, 
but let's not rely on London. We have our own currency. Uh, let's take over from London. So I tend to, it, it's open, uh, I, I, but um, uh, I tend to be pessimistic in, in that regard. I don't think that working rights in European Union will improve for British people. Another question is, why do you think Elizabeth, uh, um, excuse me, um, why do you think, uh, it was um, written here, Elizabeth, I think it's meant to be Theresa May, um, why, why the Brexit uh, that she negotiated um, was so heavily rejected before the final approval, um, which ultimately ended up being uh, the Brexit that Boris Johnson um, was leading. May, may I quickly say something about that? Um, sure. The relatively soft Brexit, staying inside the customs union and the single market that she did negotiate, it's what she wanted. Uh, it wasn't massively rejected. It was rejected by a call uh, from the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, 10 MPs on whom her uh, parliamentary majority depended. It was a very particular internal part of British politics which made it happen. Um, uh, uh, it was a, a, a disaster in certain senses and it was unbelievably stupid from the Democratic Unionist Party because rejecting that meant that there would indeed be a border separating the mainland from Northern Ireland. They, they shot themselves in the foot. It's one of the key moments of the whole process. Um, but it wasn't a general rejection. It was a parliamentary uh, dependency on the Democratic Unionist Party. Those 10 MPs changed the course of Brexit negotiations. Professor Lewis, if I may ask you this question from a participant who's in London at the moment. Uh, this person writes, I'm intrigued to know, what do Canadians think of Brexit? Um, well, it's when I'm asked uh, what Brits think of Brexit as well, I, I go to my own personal experience and all of my family and friends are staunch Remainers. So um, I'm talking uh, to a very select group and I, I would say the same about Canadians. Uh, uh, all of my contacts uh, and uh, friends and colleagues uh, cannot understand any more than I can why Britain made this huge blunder. Um, I suspect that that is the overall um, majority Canadian opinion. I haven't, even outside my little bubble, I haven't uh, heard a lot of um, Canadian voices uh, supporting Brexit. I don't know whether John uh, Dan I agree. heard anything uh, different. I, agree. I think that's a, the, the Brexit took place at the same time Canada was negotiating a trade deal with the European Union just the opposite of what Brexit did to the UK. So I think my impression is very little sympathy in Canada for what uh, uh, Johnson's government has done. Can I, can I just go back to the earlier question about uh, Theresa May? Um, yeah. There was a certain point after uh, May had um, attempted to increase her majority uh, she went to the polls in 2017 and she ended up um, losing um, uh, support. Um, and then you got a very heavily divided parliament. Um, and the deal that she then negotiated um, was rejected by the right of her party because it wasn't hard enough but it was rejected by the bulk of the Labour Party and the Lib Dems and everyone else um, because in this um, period of a hung parliament they saw the prospect uh, of pushing for a second referendum, defeating the government. So, you know, you, you got these uh, votes on the deal that, uh, a May's deal that were defeated by several hundred, the biggest defeats in parliamentary history. Um, and it's because um, the, uh, the Remainers were too optimistic, as it turned out, uh, and the hardliners um, did not want any kind of soft Brexit. 
Um, and it's in the fallout uh, from all of that, that standoff, uh, that uh, finally we got um, the uh, resignation of May, the ascent of Johnson, uh, and then in the next election, um, his uh, increased majority. That's, that's entirely correct. Um, uh, but there was this moment when uh, May was in Brussels and a phone call went or came in from the Northern Ireland saying that they would not support her in Parliament if she carried on with that soft approach. So there's you know, a, a minor crucial moment and then these uh, tectonic plates, if you like, shifting, moving all the time, making it very hard to come. Both factors were at work. Okay. Post-industrial areas in the UK benefited enormously from EU subsidies. How could the left behinds believe that leaving the EU would make them less left behind than they are? This is one of the questions that's been submitted. So um, is that something you'd like to comment on, Dr. Sorry, Professor Hall? I made you a doctor. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I am a doctor, just so I can't help you if you're ill. Um, there you go, I knew. <laughs> I, I, the answer is I don't really know. Um, I don't think the regional subsidies were enormous to the north of England. They were very present in Wales, where which was seen as an underdeveloped area, uh, enormously present, of course, in Poland and so on. I don't think really very much went to uh, uh, Durham, uh, or to uh, Manchester or Leeds. Uh, uh, so I don't think it's, I, I suspect it's not true that they benefited enormously uh, in that way. But I might be wrong and I'm happy to be corrected if I am. Okay. I think, I think you're, uh, you're correct. Um, but I would say uh, the, the, the reason why so many people uh, in the north, including Lancashire, which is where I'm from, which went solidly for leave, uh, seem to vote against their uh, own economic uh, self-interests, um, had a lot to do with the success of uh, UKIP uh, and then the leave campaign in um, deflecting attention from the, the root causes um, of uh, increasing inequality uh, and uh, deindustrialization and so on, and blaming inappropriate targets like the European Union uh, and uh, above all immigrants. Um, and the way that this message was drip fed by the, uh, um, the media, which um, largely owned by either foreigners uh, or people uh, living offshore, um, not uh, closely connected to the European Union. And then how this message was amplified by social media uh, with its um, uh, silo formation, um, I, I think explains uh, a, a, a lot about how people were getting a certain message and it was being totally uh, constantly reinforced, and other ideas were not getting through. Can I just add one thing, just to reiterate one of Brian Lewis's excellent points? Um, there was the absolute absence of the Labour Party campaigning to remain, um, which allowed this monotonic uh, message to go across. The people who are going to suffer from Brexit most are the people at the bottom of British society. The Labour Party, because it had its own illusions, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was a member of the 1980s Labour Party, imagining that socialism in one country was possible. Um, uh, Brian had it as a minor cause. Uh, I think when he writes it down, he needs to make it a major cause. Thank you. When it comes to writing the book, John, I will take that under advisement. Thank you both so much. Uh, I'd like to say to the audience, thank you for your wonderful questions. If we didn't get to them, I do apologize. It's such a, um, an emotive topic. Everyone, uh, of course, has, has something to say on it. And, um, and unfortunately, we don't have enough time to get through every question that was submitted. So if yours wasn't covered, I do apologize. Um, and hopefully we'll have other opportunities to have conversations like these in the future. 
I just wanted to make a few closing remarks. I'd like to, um, unfortunately, we're here right at the end of our time together today. I want to thank again, Professor Lewis and Professor Hall for being part of this event with us today. Most of all, thank you to all of you for joining. We really appreciate that. And before closing, just one final note, McGill officially kicked off its bicentennial in March of this year. So we'll be celebrating the launch of our third century with alumni events, online activities, and more. You can stay up to date by checking out the McGill alumni website at alumni.mcgill.ca and the university's official bicentennial website, which is 200.mcgill.ca. Thank you once again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.